This is linear algebra. My goal here in this channel is to create a series of videos for you which you can use as a resource in your study of linear algebra. As such, videos will be time-stamped, organized, Oy vey, I have such plans. Let's see what happens. There is a text in the description uh, linked down there. Go ahead and grab it. It's a text which I am using under the Creative Commons license. I am not connected with the text. It's not my text. Let's get started. Let's suppose you have a sack containing salt and sugar and it weighs 10 kilograms. If we call the mass of salt X and the mass of sugar we'll call Y, then X plus Y equals 10. That's a linear equation which we can express on this graph. All of our possible combinations are illustrated in this downward sloping line. Over here is one extreme where we're all sugar and no salt and on the other end is all salt and no sugar and here's everything in between. That's a linear equation as opposed to a non-linear equation. Linear, non-linear. How difficult can this be? We will go deep into these equations. This is easy to represent on a two-dimensional surface because we're only dealing with sugar and salt. But imagine if we were also dealing with flour. We'd be then dealing with three dimensions. Add any number of components to our mixture and we increase the number of dimensions beyond which we can picture. This is why we must deal with linear algebra, not, say, linear geometry, say. At the beginning, we'll draw pictures and graphs where we can, but we want to be able to abstract our algebra to model systems that we can't draw on paper. Let's go back to our sack of sugar and salt, but to emphasize the fact that we could potentially be dealing with more dimensions than there are letters in the alphabet. Instead of X and Y, we're going to use subscripts to distinguish our variables. So X subscript one will be sugar, X subscript 2 will be salt. And so now we've got X1 plus X2 equals 10. Same line as before, just different labels. I still don't know how much of this is sugar and how much of this is salt, but what if I took a sample and weighed it? And I found out that in this new sample, there's a total combined weight of 3 kilograms. Does having taken this sample tell us about the relative composition? Absolutely not. These two lines are actually parallel. If we were to extend them, they would never meet. We want a more useful second piece of information, such as what if? Let's suppose that we discovered that for every two grams of salt, we have one gram of sugar. We would represent that with this second equation B. That would be a line going through the origin. It meets our first line only in one spot. There is only one place where we meet both conditions. Now we can use some algebra to figure out what that one place is. Let's simply take these two equations and add them x sub 1 plus 2x sub 1 is 3x sub 1. And 
x sub 2 minus x sub 2 is 0. They're just going to cancel each other out. And then 10 plus 0 is 10. That means that x sub 1 is 1 third of 10, or 10 thirds. We can put that information into either one of these equations, do a little bit more algebra, and find out that our salt is in the amount of 20 thirds. We have solved this system of equations. Now there's a third approach we could have taken. We could have said, when I have two such sacks, they weigh 20 kilograms. The problem here is, duh, both lines A and B are on top of each other. So our first situation had gave us parallel lines. There were no solutions at all. There is no way that the two sacks could have contained the same amount of sugar and salt. Our second approach gave us exactly one solution. The two straight lines only cross in one place and our solution is at that intersection. And then this situation, it's trivial. There's an infinite number of solutions. I said it was two of the same sack and they graph to being two of the same line. This is what you want to ask when you're solving a system of linear equations like this. Are there no solutions, an infinite number of solutions, or a unique solution? Those are your three options. Also, if you feel that you're getting some value out of this video, please remember to hit the like button so that the algorithm will look upon me favorably. You'll recall from our first example with the salt and the sugar that we needed at least two equations before we had any hope of finding one unique solution. This example from the textbook shows us two equations and four unknowns. That's more unknowns than equations, and that just won't do. So we do what we always do in math. We assign a letter to something and pretend it means something. So we'll make up a solution for each of these extra unknowns. We'll say that x sub 3 is s, and x sub 4 is t, and we'll call these fake solutions parameters. They're in the twilight zone. They are neither variables nor constants, but we will treat them as constants, and they will help us find a family of solutions for the other two unknowns. We'll rewrite each equation, substituting the parameters s and t for the extra variables. Now we'll isolate the variables from the constants, treating the parameters as if they are constants. Now we'll solve this modified system of equations. Let's take this second equation and multiply everything in it by a constant, by 2. Do the same thing on the right and subtract this new second equation from the first equation. We'll get minus 3x sub 1. These will cancel. Minus 3 comes down. Minus 3s minus minus 6x s is 3s minus t minus 2t is minus 3t, and then divide everything by minus 3. This gives us a solution for x sub 1 in terms of our parameters. Let's substitute our solution for x sub 1 into this first equation. That's x sub 1, then minus 2x sub 2 equals this stuff. We'll put the constant and the parameters all together on one side. This comes over here. The signs change. 
And let's simplify. We've got minus 1, minus 3. That's minus 4. Plus s, minus 3s. So that's minus 2s, minus t, minus t, minus 2t. Then divide everything by negative 2. And we have x sub 2 in terms of the parameters. We call our solution for x sub 1 and the parameters by which we defined x sub 3 and x sub 4. So essentially we've solved two of the variables in terms of two of the other variables. We have a family of solutions. Everything that we've done here so far, we can condense down to the bare minimum. And this is the matrix. Our original set of equations is contained within this coefficient matrix. We'll separate the constants by a little line and call it an augmented matrix. Here's the principle. The matrix has a solution and we can modify the matrix with elementary row operations, giving us a new matrix with the same solution. For example, if this is row one and this is row two, we can swap rows. This new matrix has the same solution. We can also reverse the row operation. No change to the solution. We can also multiply any row by a constant. In this example, we'll multiply row two by negative one. And we can also reverse that. New matrix, same solution. Finally, we can take a multiple of one row and add it to another row. Also reversible process. Let's do that thing again where we multiply a row by a constant. Do it again with the top row, add the bottom row to the top row, and finally multiply the top row by one half. This final matrix has the same solution as the original matrix. But let me ask you, which one would you rather solve? This final matrix has the solutions listed among the constants. Was this the most efficient application of elementary row operations? We'll look at an algorithm for that in the next video. Bob's your uncle.